What is a cute misfortune about? Cute misfortune is about uh, the relationship between a journalist and an artist. It's about a, a relationship between a subject and his biographer. And it's about the Australian artist Adam Cullen, who died in 2012 at the age of 46. And, and his biographer, who was a 19-year-old, um, very gifted young journalist at the Sydney Morning Herald called Eric Jensen. Um, Adam had won the Archibald uh, with a painting of David Wenham. He was really notorious um, for that. And, um, and the story really concerns the last four years of Adam's life as Eric went back and forth writing his biography. Why does Adam Cullen deserve a film made about him? Well, I think Adam was an interesting question. Adam was probably the biggest painter of his generation. You know, certainly bigger painters in generations before and certainly when painting had more primacy, I think, as, a, as an art form. Um, but Adam had a career retrospective at the Art Gallery in New South Wales at the age of 42, um, which is why Eric was sent out to, to talk to him. As to why Adam Cullen, I think there's some very obvious stuff that you can say about Adam's behaviour, about some of the things that Adam represented as a person, and it's too easy to just say that those things are really, really questionable and, 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 uh, and uh, not, at all, not at all appropriate. And in fact, there's something really aberrant, you know, about a lot of that behaviour. But he was a guy who got around with swastika tattoos on his arms, and his painting, paintings hang in Malcolm and Lucy Turnbull's house. And I think that's an interesting question. What was the space that was created for this guy? What was the space that was created by this guy? And how did he kind of occupy that position culturally? But more than that, the film's a film about a relationship. The film's about a relationship like any relationship. And this relationship has particular stakes and a particular level of exchange um, that I thought was really fascinating. Uh, Adam could be extraordinarily violent, but he reserved his greatest violence for himself. And what I was interested in was someone who had leaned into those ideas, who'd conceptualised those ideas, who'd turned them into an art form. And the line between Adam's professional and personal life and his art and his existence became extremely blurred and, um, and, and it undid him in a very big way. Adam was, Adam was a narcissist um, to an extent. He was also a person who was really defined by enormous insecurity and enormous self-loathing. I don't think, Adam, you would classify as kind of defi a de definitive narcissist. I'd say there's narcissistic behaviour, but I'd say the roots are a little, probably a little bit more intriguing than that kind of blank sociopathic sort of relationship with others. Um, I think Adam was um, obsessed by a need to control people, to control reactions to him. And I think that made him very contradictory and it made him very mentally unwell. Um, and I don't know what it was that's at the root of that. And it's one of the things that this film tried to do was not to be, um, not to be easily diagnostic about the stuff. I mean, it's too easy to say, you know, Adam was a closeted homosexual and that's why he was violent. Or Adam was jaded because, you know, he won the Archibald too young and then whatever. Whatever those glib kind of assumptions might be, they're not for me to make. I didn't know Adam Cullen. What I can do is look into this conversation and look at what it really meant to me, which was a film about culture. It was a film about Australian culture. It was about, by the way, the way that it shapes us and the way that we shape it and what we reward and what we expect and the space that was kind of created for him. What is Henshaw like to work with? Henshaw is a complex individual. Henshaw is hugely emotionally intelligent. I think he's very well cast to deal with the conflict that's in Adam. I, th I was so impressed, how could you not be, by his performance in Snowtown. And that led to, let alone the fact that the physical resemblance to Adam is just insane. So there was never anybody else that could have played the part. But Dan also brought a sense of conflict and a sense of deep relatability, a sense of anger to about Adam. Personally and politically, Dan probably has more of an issue with Adam um, than, than many people. He, he really, uh, you know, found the stuff that Adam didn't said very grating, very, diffi very difficult. And, you know, we, we just worked and we went so deep together, Dan and I. I mean, the depth of research that we did, Dan was attached to this project for three years. So, to spend time with his, Adam's drug dealers, 
with his doctors, with his former partners, with his mentors, with collaborators and assistants and gallerists and everybody that we did. You know, I think it became kind of it became kind of all-consuming for, for both of us. It was a difficult shoot at times because of what he has to go through, let alone the fact that Dan loses 23 kilos or something. In the seven weeks that we shot this film, from the day that we rolled, the day, the day before we started rolling, Dan stopped eating. And then at the very end of the shoot, he started again. He just went down. It was a very carefully managed plan to do that. But that was a huge toll. Now you've directed the theatre. Mm -hmm. You're an established actor. This mm -hmm. is your first feature film as first, director. First film. Yeah, so how was your baptism? Was there any fire involved? It's so... There, no, you know, like Garth Davis, who directed Lion, just laughed before I, when I said I was going to do it. And he just said, not for the faint-hearted. <laughs> you're so exposed. Um, it's like you're forming a fairly reasonable-sized company working at an incredibly high temperature, hitting the ground running. You can't fuck up from day one, especially on an Australian film. What are you, are you gonna go back and reshoot? You're not going back to reshoot. There's no money to reshoot. All your, your money is dragging behind you as I, the skin from your hands and knees and feet as you're dragged along the ground trying to stay upright and keep going. It's, you know, it's, it's, a, um, it's very complex. The personal dynamics are very complex. Um, I loved it. I don't really particularly, you know, want to do anything else with my life. It took me a long time to find the, the, uh, the courage to kind of be able to do it. I really didn't think I had a right to do it. I always loved cinema so much, but I didn't think that I was allowed to do this. And um, it, was, um, it, was certainly, it was certainly tough. This was a tough shoot. I shot for seven weeks. You, you probably know from Australian feature film, that is really very generous. And we really insisted on that from the beginning. But this film was shot at half the budget of a film like Snowtown. So where we compromised, where we cut corners, where we had to be very savvy in terms of the structure of how this thing was set up and handled. I mean, it's a very it's com complex undertaking. But at the same time, working from a great limitation of resources is fantastic because everybody has to take accountability for what they're doing and you have to be very inventive. You know, I'd love if there were about 10 times as many people who are going to the cinema. I was looking at some archival footage in the National Film Sound Archive the other day of, of films playing on a weekend in the 70s in Sydney and you'd have queues down the block to go and see um, Australian cinema. And I wish there was that cultural primacy placed on Australian cinema more than I think there should be any, you know, it should be made easier for, for people to make them. I think Australians need to make a decision to go and see their own culture represented back to them. And I'm sure that we're going to see a change. I'm sure that we'll see a change at yeah. some point, but at the, at the moment I think it's been devalued. First time filmmakers are not extraordinarily experienced with the business side of this stuff, but I can say um, the audience has to show demand, um, but the industry also needs to place emphasis on it. There's just so much content, and somehow we've decided that we're such an international mindset now. Everything is communicated so in instantly from everywhere around the world. We feel like a very international place. But it's really important to reflect on our own culture. That's all I can say. I think there are films being made now that were they made in the 70s, everybody, everybody would know about them. Everybody would be talking about them. There are films that were made then that everybody talked about and everybody knew, which if they were released now, would disappear into yep. the ether and people, and people wouldn't necessarily know about it. It's not as though we're, we're not in a golden age of Australian cinema. Just exciting film movement over the last 25, 30 years, for me, without a doubt, is the dogma movement in Denmark. And it's because that landed like a bomb in the middle of the film industry and it said, this equipment that you have, that you have in your house, if you've got the discipline of story, you've got the discipline of innovation and kind of conceptual idea about cinema, you can make stuff that's just, just astonishing. I always felt like Australia was the right kind of place mm. for that sort of, for that sort of um, movement.